Hello and good afternoon. My name is Hannah Fuller. I'm a media officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for a webinar on the report that was just released this morning titled Measuring Probable Maximum Precipitation Estimation. You can download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at www.nap.edu. A recording of this webinar will be available with closed captioning on our website in the coming days. For those of you not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private, nonprofit institutions that provide independent, objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each requested study, Panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience and serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. I have the committee chair and members of the committee that wrote the report here with me today, but before they begin, I wanna go over a few reminders. Please note that this webinar is scheduled to last one hour We'll start off with a presentation summarizing the report by the committee members, and then we'll open it up to any questions you may have. To ask a question, just click Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type your question. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jim Smith, a research scientist and professor emeritus in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Princeton University and chair of the committee who wrote the report. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Hannah. Um, we're pleased to have reached the point uh, where we can have a dialogue with the community on the uh, conclusions and recommendations for modernizing uh, probable maximum precipitation. Uh, and we'd like to begin uh, by uh, highlighting some key take home messages from this study. So if we could move to the next slide. Uh, the first point to note uh, is that PMP is important. Uh, and the second uh, key point is that uh, major changes uh, to methods used to compute PMP are needed to assure the safety of high hazard infrastructure, uh, in particular uh, dams and nuclear power plants. Now, um, arguably the most important recommendation of the study is to develop methods for uh, estimating probable maximum precipitation using climate model simulations, uh, which we term model-based uh, PMP estimation. Now, this recommendation is the key uh, to address the challenges associated with climate change uh, and uh, to provide quantitative assessments of uncertainty in PMP estimates. Um, one of the themes that uh, uh, pervades through the report is that climate change and characterization of uncertainty in PMP estimates uh, are critical problems in assessing uh, the safety of high hazard infrastructure over the coming uh, decades. Uh, the committee noted that model-based PMP estimation uh, has advantages for uh, computing probable maximum flood relative to conventional procedures. Um, the details and the methods for computing probable maximum flood are beyond the scope of this study, uh, but the report details the important potential advantages of the model-based approach uh, for computing probable maximum uh, flood. Um, a major recommendation of the study centers on a new definition of probable maximum uh, precipitation, uh, which is based on um, annual exceedance probabilities and not uh, upper bounds of rainfall. Uh, now, this recommendation is um, it's grounded uh, in assessments of the scientific evidence uh, for the existence of bounds on rainfall um, and on statistical analyses of the problem uh, of estimating uh, bounds. Uh, so the committee concluded uh, that a new definition uh, of PMP is essential for modernizing uh, probable maximum precipitation. Uh, Model-based um, estimation of PMP um, is a major challenge, uh, and it will take uh, time uh, to implement. So the committee recommends a phased approach in which significant near-term 
uh, enhancements to probable maximum precipitation uh, lead uh, to model-based uh, estimation of PMP in the long term. Um, now, these, these core recommendations uh, reflect uh, the uh, vision for modernizing um, PMP that the committee developed. So if we could move to the next slide. Uh, so model-based estimation uh, of PMP uh, is indeed a challenging topic, but it's one that the committee feels uh, is achievable. Now, an important point to note is that the advances that are required for model-based PMP uh, estimation uh, will lead to advances in a number of high-profile societal problems uh, that are associated with climate extremes. Uh, so developing methods for uh, model-based estimation of probable maximum precipitation uh, will have impacts uh, that extend well beyond uh, the PMP uh, context. Uh, so next slide, looking at the task. Um, so the task the committee is assigned with uh, has um, uh, some review and assessment items, and these are dealt with uh, in detail in the report. Um, today, we'd like to focus on task four, uh, which is to recommend an approach for PMP estimate, estimation that incorporates the effects of climate change and also uh, um, provides for quantitative assessment uh, of uncertainty in PMP estimates. Um, now, it's envisioned uh, that this recommended approach uh, will provide a national standard uh, for estimating probable maximum precipitation. Um, next slide. So it turns out uh, that modernizing probable maximum precipitation, um, it's a challenging assignment. Um, but the Academy developed an outstanding committee to address the diverse challenges associated with uh, the problems uh, entailed in modernizing probable maximum precipitation. Uh, we also uh, benefited significantly from guidance um, in uh, providing information gathering sessions um, and I'd also like to note that the report um, substantially benefited from comments and suggestions uh, of reviewers. Um, so uh, the final report reflects the contributions uh, from a diverse community uh, involved in uh, various aspects of probable maximum precipitation. And, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to John Anglin. Um, and John will step through some of the, uh, the review and assessment and then introduce the proposed new definition for uh, PMP. John. Thanks, uh, Jim. Next slide. Great. Uh, so the report starts out um, after this. In chapter two, uh, we would define and we, we list our common understanding of PMP and the topics there, focusing on existing approaches. So the first is uh, PMP, uh, the definition has changed over time. Uh, and it's currently defined as an upper bound on rainfall. Um, however, in practice, uh, PMP estimates themselves are considered as a physical upper limit to rainfall. And the committee found that that's uh, one of the key issues. Um, as many of you may know, um, PMP is estimated using observations. So ground-based observations from storm catalogs uh, and the library of techniques uh, of their components include that, that catalog, storm transposition and maximization, uh, moisture maximization procedures with some adjustments for terrain. Um, fundamentally, uh, PMP is important to critical infrastructure shown on the right. Uh, these are the 16,000 plus high hazard dams in the United States, uh, plus the, uh, the over 50 uh, nuclear uh, reactors uh, as well. Uh, but we uh, note in the uh, chapter two is that these procedures are really old. They started fundamentally with um, NOAA and the National Weather Service, um, the Weather Bureau at the time. And there was a, this interplay between the forecast community at that time in the early uh, 1920s and the designers of these facilities. Um, we haven't made much inroads in the science that I'll allude to in a minute. And estimates from these are really old as well. Next slide, please. So for the impacts, um, this report really uh, provides timely and relevant information and valuable conclusions that go beyond PMP 
uh, in addition with our recommendations for extreme rainfall that connect infrastructure, society, and climate. So it's of interest um, to federal agencies, states, um, academia, um, dam owners, private industry, governments, and, and citizens. Um, but really, it, there's more information in, in there um, and has broader impacts on climate extremes uh, to illustrate on increased awareness and vulnerability from potential rainfall magnitudes, like the picture on the right, Hurricane Matthew in South Carolina, um, and for critical infrastructure as the dam up um, on the top in Colorado that's under construction um, today. Uh, next slide. Chapter three, or excuse me, chapter four in this report, uh, the committee uh, built on some things uh, in chapter three that covered the new science. And here uh, in chapter four, we assessed, the committee assessed existing um, approaches and their weaknesses. Uh, and the first one here on the assumption that rainfall is bounded, um, the committee concluded that there really is no strong evidence to support this fundamental tenant of PMP. Uh, and the second bullet really is a thing that we were charged with in a world where climate change is becoming more apparent. There is growing recognition that the procedures based solely on historical observations may not be appropriate for the future. So we need to include that and the current procedures do not. Uh, there's problems with the storm catalog and incompleteness. Um, most of the data is from the 20th century opportunistic bucket surveys. Recently, we've been using radar data, but the catalog is woefully incomplete to do fundamental um, statistical analysis. Uh, there's significant holes and gap in space and time. Uh, on foundations for moisture maximization and storm transposition, we've uh, the committee found problems with those and that a solid scientific basis just uh, is not at hand. And there are also some empirical correction factors um, for the complex terrain um, that um, are in need of some improvement. One of the key things we wrestled with the committee is that um, the current procedures really um, don't have the ability to quantify uncertainty, and this precludes the use of PMP in any risk-informed decision-making, which is becoming more widely adopted among government agencies and regulators. Uh, next slide, please. So the committee, um, recommends uh, a new definition uh, shown in the upper right. Uh, this really is um, to support um, the idea shown on the bottom that a first principles theory has not emerged to support the idea of the upper bound and how to characterize the magnitude of those. This new definition uh, really addresses the two critical um, weaknesses of the current PMP methods. The first is that the assumption of rainfall is bounded uh, does not provide you know, a foundation for estimating PMP and climate change has resulted in historical changes in extreme rainfall and the likelihood that greater changes could occur or will occur over the coming decades. So these two changes we recommend uh, are essential for developing scientifically grounded methods for estimating PMP. The explicit dependence of PMP on the time of year isn't included because uh, models, as we'll describe in a little bit, uh, can provide seasonally varying estimates uh, and they provide the attractive way to um, get to uncertainty. So now um, I'll pass it back to Jim, who will step us through how we um, are achieve this uh, vision and definition uh, with a roadmap. So recommend, recommendation 5-1 uh, lays out the linchpin of the phased approach to modernizing uh, probable maximum precipitation estimation with a near-term approach uh, leading to a long-term model-based approach. Uh, figure 5-1 uh, provides a schematic representation uh, for the roadmap, uh, pointing out how uh, the key recommendations uh, interact uh, on each of these elements. Um, the schematic gives a timeline from current uh, PMP practice to near-term estimation that will occur within five years, and then it's envisioned uh, in another five to 10 years, um, model-based estimation of uh, PMP will occur. Now, um, an, a, a key recommendation is for a model evaluation project. Um, it will uh, provide a number of important uh, elements uh, to um, 
uh, the entire process. It will be a key to determining when models are fit for purpose uh, for model-based PMP estimation, but it'll also provide important uh, tools for scientific enhancements uh, to near-term enhancements, uh, to near-term uh, PMP estimation. Uh, note that the recommended definition applies uh, when we reach model-based -base PMP estimation. Uh, and so we've got uh, key recommendations for near-term and long-term. Um, and for the long-term uh, estimation, um, uh, I'll turn things to Ruby Lung and uh, Dan Cooley, uh, who will uh, step through some of the key elements uh, in uh, achieving the long-term model-based PMP estimation. Uh, Ruby. All right. Yes. So the recommended PMP definition that John just talked about requires estimating the depth of precipitation with an extremely low annual exceedance probability for a changing climate. Because observational record is not sufficient to quantify such events and also how they may change with the evolving climate. So we recommend a model based approach for estimating PMP in the long term. The model based approach consists of large ensemble modeling using multiple models at kilometer scale or final resolution. So the large ensemble modeling using multiple models allows us to quantify uncertainty related to natural variability and, and also uncertainty related to models. And kilometer scale or final resolution combined with large ensemble simulations are important to capture precipitation events with extremely low probability of occurrence. So this modeling approach let us construct the probability distribution of precipitation for PMP estimation under different climates. So now I'm going to hand over to Dan to talk about the statistical approach of estimating PMP. Great, thanks, uh, Ruby. Um, yeah, the um, right in the statement of task, uh, the, uh, the committee was asked to uh, address quantification of uncertainty, and, and the report talks about statistical uncertainty, and this is the, the kind of uncertainty that we're all familiar with, that as sample size grows, the uncertainty decreases. And so John England uh, mentioned that the, the storm catalogs are, are incomplete, but even kind of more fundamental to that, the, the, the current calculation method for PMP really doesn't lend itself well to the notion of statistical sample. And so trying to get statistical uncertainty using current methods for PMP calculation is, is, is we think is impossible. So what we're recommending is that uh, to, to pr produce the PMP uh, estimate, we recommend that extreme value methods are used. Um, these methods are, are, are well justified, widely used, uh, theoret theoretically justified. They don't require the assumption of an upper bound. And statistical quantification of uncertainty is also well developed and, and comes right along with the, the estimate. What is uh, uh, perhaps different or what, what's very different about the, the PMP estimation is that it'll be, uh, what we envision is that it'll be applied to these uh, model ensemble runs that, that Ruby just, just spoke of. Um, the, the, the other point that uh, I, I want to make is that it'll be uh, very important to keep statisticians involved throughout this phased approach uh, as things move forward toward the eventual model-based estimation and, and, and decisions about the, the, how the uh, estimate is produced, for instance, how much borrowing of strength is required will have to be developed over time over this uh, phased approach. So now let me pass things back to Jim. And next slide for near-term enhancement. So we go back to near-term enhancements and there are three principal components of the near-term uh, enhancements, one involving uh, better data, a second involving scientific guidance on these issues that John raised uh, that are uh, concerns uh, where there is not a, uh, an adequate scientific foundation for current methods. And the one that will come later uh, just after this is um, climate change. Um, we viewed uh, climate change as um, a problem that is of such importance that even in the near-term enhancements, uh, we need to include a climate change uh, component. 
the model-based approach provides um, the, the, uh, the best long-term, but we need to address it in near-term enhancements. So for data, uh, there are three elements. One is digitizing uh, the existing storm catalog data. The second uh, is effectively using um, data, particularly from uh, the radar network in the US. And then the third uh, is to use data that are created from historical reconst model reconstructions uh, of storms. Um, so these data components uh, will provide uh, important resources for um, enhancing um, PMP estimates in the, in the near term. Um, they also will provide a critical resource uh, for evaluating models. And the near term and long term um, um, uh, elements of modernizing PMP are interrelated in various ways. Data will serve to uh, improve our capabilities uh, uh, to model um, extreme precipitation. Uh, on the flip side, um, the modeling studies are going to provide key uh, guidance, scientific guidance uh, on um, the procedures that are used, um, uh, the conventional procedures that are used uh, for PMP computations, uh, storm transposition, moisture maximization, and orographic transposition factors. Uh, so this inner interrelationship between the near term and the long term is an important uh, uh, element to emphasize. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, turn things over to John Nielsen Gammon, uh, who will talk about the near term uh, approach uh, for addressing uh, climate change. And this is yours. Jim, this is yours. Pardon? Oh, I'm. I am sorry. John is not uh, here for this. Can we step to the next slide? Uh, John participated yesterday, and uh, I had forgotten that he wouldn't be here today. So, uh, for um, climate change uh, in the near term, um, we uh, propose adopting uh, climate change adjustment factors uh, based on uh, model scaling relationships. Uh, between extreme precipitation and uh, and temperature, so these will um, uh, incorporate um, uh, model-based analyses uh, in the near term, uh, and they will provide a pathway for um, integrating uh, assessments of climate change uh, within uh, the near-term uh, enhancements uh, period. So those are the components of uh, uh, of uh, near term. Um, and now we will move to the model evaluation project uh, and Katie Holman will uh, uh, introduce those ideas. Thanks, Jim. Uh, you gave a uh, you gave a really nice overview, I, I think, of, of some of the ways in which we're, we're bridging these approaches, the near term enhancements and the, and the model based estimation. Um, so the model evaluation project really represents an iterative process that's designed to assess model skill identify model improvements, demonstrate methods for quantifying impacts of climate change on probable maximum precipitation, and ultimately determine when models are suitable uh, for transitioning to these model-based estimates of PMP. As this graphic suggests, um, you know, the model evaluation project really links near-term enhancements, our plans, our recommendations for near-term enhancements, with this longer-term plan for model-based estimates. And it, and it does this through data enhancements, like Jim mentioned, we're talking about model simulations, documenting model simulations and, and development and evaluation needs, and then also enhancing our scientific understanding um, in, in terms of how we implement PMP. Now, um, one major goal of the model evaluation project is determining when models are fit for purpose, fit, fit for, for purpose, um, and achieving fitness for purpose will ultimately depend on model skill and model performance but also broader community acceptance of the, the models, the methods, the analysis, and the proposed um, plans by NOAA and, and um, the crew. So that's something we really wanna emphasize here, that this um, we're, we're trying to achieve fitness for purpose and we're trying to involve the scientific and operational communities together. And from here, we'll move to Effie. Next slide, please. 
So in concluding here, we repeat the vision, which is model-based probabilistic estimates of extremely low exceedance probability precipitation depths under current and future climates at space and time scales relevant for design and safety analysis of critical infrastructure. As Jim said, this is an ambitious but achievable vision, but it, it will require all hands of deck. Uh, we need to bring together federal agencies, academia, and the private sector uh, to collaborate and probably create some strategic initiatives to uh, increase and make this collaboration more fruitful. Uh, it was also mentioned, and it is very important to emphasize here, that the value, utility, the need, and significance of this work from the near-term enhancement to the full um, uh, implementation of the long-term vision of model-based PMP uh, will have a lot of return on investment. Uh, the uh, extremes we have witnessed, they're amplifying, and the uh, hazards uh, that we see uh, are exponentially increasing. For example, the NOAA estimates of the 2023 uh, severe uh, weather-related hazards amounts to 500 billion. So we still don't understand how the global warming will affect uh, extreme precipitation at all scales from the small sub-kilometer to sub-hour to the larger scales for uh, downstream flood prediction. And this analysis and all this five to 10 year investment uh, will increase our resiliency uh, to extreme events and uh, um, extreme storm related uh, hazards, including property, a loss of property and life. So this is an important message. Uh, it is all the study is towards the long term uh, PMP model based, but the next five to 10 years will be so critical in understanding extreme storms and increasing the resilience of uh, and vulnerability to extreme hazards. Uh, Jim, back to you. Okay. Uh, modernizing probable maximum precipitation is in, indeed a challenging a assignment, um, but the collegiality and commitment uh, of the team resulted in a report uh, which we hope provides useful guidance um, on moving forward on this important problem. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, each of the members of uh, the committee for their efforts as well as the staff. Uh, and I would especially like to thank uh, Stephen Stichter and Jonathan Tucker for shepherding this process uh, to this point over the last year and a half. And then at this point, we'll uh, move into the questions phase of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, like Jim said, we have uh, time for a Q&A now. Um, thanks to everybody who has already asked questions in the Q&A box, feel free to keep those coming over the next few minutes or 30 minutes. We've got some good time here. So um, I guess I'll get us started here. Our first question for the committee is, are there any specific recommendations for how to address PNP in high elevation basins where reliable observations are not available? Well, I'll, I'll start with uh, um, um, so the uh, high elevation or mountainous terrain uh, was identified in the 1994 uh, study on PMP as one of the most important or most challenging problems. Uh, and in uh, the current report, it is again identified as a challenging problem. Um, there are um, advances that we point to that are tied to observations uh, in the near term, uh, but we feel that the key to making advances is going to be uh, model-based. And so another rationale for um, the model-based uh, approach to estimating PMP is that it will um, uh, give us um, the ability to deal with some of the most challenging problems of PMP estimation. Uh, which uh, are mountainous terrain uh, and um, uh, small area, short duration uh, convective rainfall. And let's see, um, Russ, John, anyone else want to chime in on uh, on that? Katie? Yeah, yeah, I'll chime in. Uh, 
Oh. We're, uh, th there's not specific call outs on the models, but the models have been used already. So a call in New Mexico study that was performed uh, in two states out here um, in Lakewood um, used the HER to really help with, uh, so existing operational model to, to help with the convective parts and the high ter uh, terrain. So we're trying to bring models in at that point. And so, yeah, I could ask Katie to maybe elaborate on, it sort of fits in with that near-term part and the model validation project. I think that's a good point, John. Other, are there, that's a, that is um, highlighted in the report. It's a very, very important issue uh, moving forward um, with PMP. Ruby, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, perhaps might be useful to also add that there have been um, studies now showing that modeling capabilities in terms of capturing precipitation in mountainous area now could surpass what we can get from observation because like as, as noted in the question, right, because there is really a lack of observation data. So this has been shown over the Western United States mountainous area, as well as other mountainous area around the world. So modeling approach would be really helpful in this regard. Thanks, you guys. I'm going to move us on to the next question, um, which is that the proposed definition uses the phrase extremely low annual probability. What does extremely low probability mean to the committee? Uh, I'll kick things off again. Um, uh, an annual exceedance probability is the conventional way of dealing with precipitation frequency analysis. Um, so in the most basic sense, we are working in a conventional precipitation frequency analysis framework. Uh, the extremely low uh, highlights the fact that we are in a different world than uh, the NOAA Atlas 14, NOAA Atlas 15, uh, precipitation frequency analysis. We're looking at uh, annual exceedance probabilities that are likely orders of magnitude lower uh, than the lowest uh, that are envisioned for the NOAA Atlas products. Um, those are some initial thoughts, and I'll let um, other committee members uh, chime in on that. This is John. So two things. One is um... What I didn't talk about specifically on the slide with the recommended definition is the recommendation. Uh, so in the slides we show that you can look back later, uh, recommendation 5.4 really points to NOAA and FEMA National Dam Safety in partnership with federal states and ASDSO to develop guidance for specifying what that AAP should be. Uh, there's a box in chapter four, box 4.2, that points to the AAP ranges that we've seen in the Western United States from 10 to minus four to 10 to minus seven um, with a couple of figures that you can see there. Russ, did you have something to add? No. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, and John, thanks for all those specific figures for people to go look at. I know the report was just released a few hours ago, so having those as guideposts is always really helpful. Um, our next question for the committee is, uh, the committee states specifying annual exceedance probabilities, AEPs, to define PMP as a challenging acceptable risk question. Why not focus on estimation of the distribution of extreme rainfall instead of a specific AEP and leave acceptable risk to the decision process? So I'll again give a first take on that. Um, the um, AEP is one component of the risk side. Um, and one of the um, important elements that the committee wrestled with is that uh, we need to estimate PMP and we need to provide uncertainty characterization. And so what we have is, you know, we will, uh, through a process that involves community uh, engagement, uh, arrive at uh, national guidance for specifying AEPs. That's the recommendation. But in addition to having uh, rainfall associated with these AEPs, we still need to characterize uncertainty. Uh, and that gets at the sort of key elements uh, that are needed for risk-informed uh, decision-making. And so it brings in some of the, uh, the 
the themes that are in, in, in involved in that question. Other thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so we have the near term and long term um, framework here. And so there are key parts that we won't get to AAPs directly um, that we have recommended in the near term approach. So getting to the full definition in the long term takes, you know, two steps essentially going through some model evaluation. And so in the long term approach, you actually could we we don't call this out. Um, you, you get you get a, a full distribution um, and the user could choose. We recommend though using the models to estimate PMP. So that on the decision side, we only give an example uh, again in chapter four on a risk profile that really is should be appropriately chosen by um, the regulator, the decision maker themselves um, and the community um, at large. And did you have anything to add or should we move on to the next question? All right, I'll move us on. Um, all right, our next question is, um, how do you handle uncertainties for such a rare event using limited data? How reliable is extreme value analysis for low probability estimates? And how would uncertainty values be used by end users? I'll go ahead and, and jump in here and then uh, welcome any other committee members to, to follow up. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that, that the, uh, the problem is very challenging. When we're trying to deal with, with uh, AEPs of 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus seven. Uh, it's inherent in the problem that there are going to be, there, there are likely to be uh, large uncertainties. And so one of the tasks moving forward will be to glean how much information is uh, obta obtainable from the model simulations themselves. If, if, if uh, under the coming decade, if, if there is an abundance of, of uh, model runs uh, of ensembles, then that's gonna uh, increase our sample size and, and decrease the uncertainty. And choices will be have, have to be made about how much, uh, for instance, uh, borrowing strength across space is needed to drive down those uncertainties. And of course, the, the, those sorts of methods uh, increase the statistical complexity of, of, of um, producing that estimate. You know, the, how the uncertainty values get used, I, I think is, uh, is, is really the, the, a question for the end user. I mean, it, it would be um, uh, bad practice to provide an estimate without any uncertainty. And, and we need to be honest about how much uncertainty is associated with that, with that, uh, with that estimate, and I know that uh, that agencies are are currently doing risk based uh, uncertainty analysis, and so already there are agencies that are that are uh, integrating that uncertainty into their ultimate decisions. But I think that that uncertainty is uh, at best, or, or or it needs to be an honest assessment of of how much uh, precision is exists with that estimate, and then. Uh, decisions by users uh, has to be made uh, based on that on that number. Uh, so, others want to chime in on that. Uh, I'll just one point is that um, driving up the sample size is one of the important uh, challenges, and uh, there are various elements to it. Uh, one is just simple sort of the sort of the brute force computational resources that are available. Uh, but there are also uh, ways that um, that we think um, that uh, on the computational side, cleverness uh, can enhance sample, uh, the effective sample size. Um, so we uh, we recognize that this is a, a very challenging problem and it's as Effie in, emphasized it's a an all hands on deck um, um, effort to uh, move us forward to um, to have the resources to uh, to uh, achieve the um, goal of model based uh, estimation. A uh, couple of things to add here uh, is the statistical approaches in chapter three; those advances. So in, in 
the era of climate change, which we're in, um, they readily handle it. And the models provide some physics and appropriate physics. So we try to integrate the physics from the model um, simulations with the statistics um, to, as Dan mentioned earlier, estimate that uncertainty um, robustly. Yeah, and I think for both of these, uh, you know, for this question and also the previous question, um, once, you know, assuming that that vision is possible to be achieved, right, a side benefit of it is that you you would get you get the entire distribution. It's not just about, I mean, you, you, there's a, a need for a PMP to match an AEP, um, but at the same time, once those model runs are available and they're, you know, they're done and they're trusted, you, you, if you wanted to choose a different AEP that you were concerned about, that would be a part of the, the suite of products that would be available. It wouldn't just be a, a single number. And then similarly, the uncertainties would go along with that as well. But that's not something that's going to be available, you know, next year. That's a, that's a, a long, that's part of the long-term vision, not the near-term portion. Thank you all. Um, our next question is, state dam safety programs regulate the majority of dams in the U.S., and they will need to have confidence and understanding of updated methods. How do you anticipate inclusion of state regulatory agencies going forward? Jim, can I take this or start? At least hey, I was going to say, why don't um, you've thought a lot about that and contributed a lot to the ideas that we've developed. So have at it. Yeah. Uh, if you if you go to the beginning of chapter five, uh, we list some core principles that we recommend for moving forward with updating PMP estimates. And one of those core principles is this idea of something like a co-production of knowledge, which is basically that NOAA, they're, they're leading these efforts to update PMP estimates. We have this plan for near-term enhancements. We have a or we have recommendations and recommendations for transitioning to this long-term approach. But during these pro during these processes, um, all of these processes, we are ask asking for collaboration, communication, and engagement. And that's with uh, state dam safety programs. That's with federal dam safety programs, federal agencies. We're talking about regulatory agencies. We are asking and, and recommending that NOAA facilitate and you know these are these events where you can envision information sharing from from all parties. Essentially, the scientific community articulating and communicating methods and plans to the user community, and the user community responding and saying at the same time, "This would work for us, or this would not." Um, this really this collaboration process has to happen, starting you know now, and and like in order to make progress that. All, all of these communities have to be involved, the scientific and the operational and user, um, all of these disciplines. And so we've, we've made those recommendations specifically. Anything else, Jim? Other thoughts on that from the committee? No, and I think, Kate, you should mention more about the model evaluation project. If that was not very clear, I think this will bring together, you know, the ideas of the past and the ideas of the future in, in deciding um, the annual excellence probability, regulatory uh, agency questions, and so forth. So if if that was not clear, probably you could say a little more about the... Well, and as... That's great, Effie. Thank you. Um, as part of the model evaluation project, we have, we have recommended that the models are not simply deemed appropriate simply simply by the scientific community. We have recommended to NOAA that, that these changes are acceptable by the end user community as well as the scientific community. And I, I, we, we, uh, I, I hope to say that many times in the coming years, this isn't something we would like NOAA and the climate science community, the, the weather community and the statistical communities to say, okay, here's your product. We would like this to be a collaborative process um, where the end users are engaged, they are informed, they have opportunities for asking questions and making recommendations and discussing, um, learning, and and really just, it's it's similar to this idea of co-production of knowledge in that the, these communities are moving forward together and engaging. And it's related to the model evaluation project, like Effie said, where the models are, are deemed fit for purpose by members of all of these communities, not just one community alone.
And I, I just note that the importance of it is reflected in the fact that the first recommendation in chapter five is the um, is the phased approach, but the second one is the engagement recommendation. And so we see it um, as one of the um, key ingredients of uh, successful uh, implementation of recommendations. Shi Chi, did you want to add to this discussion? Uh, yes, I, I want to highlight that uh, that's why we recommended a phase approach. Uh, we we understand that uh, we don't want to see a, a sudden change and uh, uh, we want to, um, so that's why we recommend that we uh, will work together with the stakeholder and we want to do a phased change and also use the chance to uh, let everybody get a chance to get a good feeling about how model can do for PMB simulation and until the time we feel we're ready. Um, and that's informed by the uh, model and comparison project. And that's when we will, uh, community will be ready to move forward to the future PNP. Our next question is related and, and maybe goes a little bit beyond. So it says that if the de definition of PNP is changed, um, a lot of states would have to change their state laws and regulations on dams. And if the states change those laws, uh, there's a possibility that they could lose their dam safety program. So what does the committee provide any recommendations on a state level for how to proceed with that potential future? John, do you want to take a crack at that? Sure. Uh, yeah, each state is unique in some ways. Some, you know, states just started a dam safety program where others, you know, had foundational dam safety programs, you know, decades ago. Um, working through that fits in with the, as Katie mentioned, co-production and the FAIR principles uh, and recommendation 5.3, the new definition, and 5.4, it's that partnership, really. Um, so ASDSO really was instrumental in getting legislation through. So we are sitting before you um, and finishing this report, uh, presenting it to you from this so that we can flip that around and say, you know, the FEMA National Dam Safety Program through FEMA, um, various federal agencies, the old definition, you know, the last one was settled by the Corps and the Bureau and some others. Uh, there's a long Appendix C that describes some of that long history. Uh, we can continue that today by growing and in, in adding states and ASDSO, ASCE, so that it's commensurate. And so um, this possibility would be reduced, um, but that's projection with the report does not provide a specific recommendation other than um, on laws, other than the collaboration that I just described. Um, it's certainly a, an, an important issue. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things that uh, would likely be an important point of discussion through organizations like ASDSO is we have um, we have changed the definition of PMP. Um, PMP is now defined in a different way. Um, and to the extent that state laws refer to uh, PMP as a design criterion, um, a, a question would uh, arise as to what extent uh, is it necessary to make changes uh, when, you know, PMP, um, the uh, elements of computing and defining PMP have changed, uh, is it necessary to change state laws uh, to reflect that? Or um, is it possible to have a guidance that says that this is now PMP? Um, and it's part of what John referred to as this, uh, and Katie, this community engagement process to, um, to, um, bring in the stakeholders to um, ensure that um, that uh, the process um, uh, moves smoothly at all levels, including that level of implementation. Thank you guys. Um, and thanks to our audience for all the questions. Keep them coming. We're gonna see how many we can fit in in our last 10 minutes here. So our next question is, has there been any coordination with the World Meteorological Organization for worldwide application, or is this new approach envisioned to apply only in the US? Steve, I, 
I, I think the answer is no, but I'll defer to Stephen on the uh, administrative side. Um, we, the specific uh, statement of task that um, that we discussed with NOAA um, is really focused on the needs of development of the next stages of development of PMP uh, within the United States. Um, we do know from um, the interest that has been shown to this project throughout um, the information gathering sessions and other inquiries that we've received, um, that there are similar questions that are active in other countries. Um, so it was not under the committee's charge to speak to the broader global discussion, but we, um, we certainly hope that the deep work that the committee has done is a significant contribution to those conversations that are going on uh, in multiple countries around the globe. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for jumping in there. Uh, our next question is, um, so you all, as long-term data, are insufficient for estimating the low probability extreme rainfall. You all have proposed a model-based approach. Uh, what length of model runs do you envision will be necessary to produce extremely low probability events? Um, maybe I can speak to that a bit first. Um, so we are envisioning using model-based approach and this model-based approach, a very important part of this is the ensemble size, right? So so we don't just run a single simulation. Uh, so the size of the ensemble that we are envisioning would be at least of the order of, let's say, like between 50 to 100 members. And so these are like... Uh, uh, ensemble simulations where we perturb the initial condition. And so the, it gives us the range of probability of things happening uh, simply because of natural variability. And then there's also like multi-model ensemble. So we would include multiple models and things like that. In terms of the length, um, that really depends on like what particular time, uh, climate time period that we wanted to estimate for the PMP. So let's say if we are interested in looking at at the mid-century, then the length of the simulation has to run through the mid-century. But but I would envision this probably would have to go through like the uh, towards the end of the century, where we would need to really um, uh, quantify the PMP uh, for multiple time period projecting into the future. But again, the most important part is really the size of the ensemble that, that really matters in terms of like giving you the extremely low probability events. Let me just add that uh, there is a figure in the report, and unfortunately, I don't know the figure number, but we, we have a schematic which talks about uh, how the sample size and sample size here is is a, is essentially number of observations over the threshold um used to 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 make the the PMP calculation but maybe an easier way to think about it is is roughly number of years of uh, uh the ensemble run to achieve a, a certain percent uh width of a of a, of a standard uh confidence interval calculation so that that figure gives gives uh, some idea, but I think it's it's safe to say that that uh, uh, this would be a, a massive modeling exercise to to provide uh, estimates of of usable uh, confidence interval widths or, or usable un uncertainties. Great. Um, I'm going to ask two questions that are kind of related to each other. So. Uh, so one of our questions is, how does this new definition of PMP impact probable maximum flood estimations for the design of dams and other infrastructure? And would the committee recommend pursuing significant and inv expensive investments in infrastructure based on the short-term adjustments to the PMP or waiting for the long-term modeling tools? Just a quick observation on the PMF, um, what we pointed to advantages of um, model-based PMP estimation for computing probable maximum flood. And uh, one of the advantages uh, is that um, you can have analyses that are drainage basin based. Um, and beyond that, as Russ alluded to, is that you can have observations uh, that include more than just the 
uh, the PMP magnitude for a particular area and size, you can have spatial and temporal distributions of rainfall, um, which wind up being uh, key uh, ingredients in converting probable maximum precipitation uh, to probable maximum uh, flood. Um, so the, 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 uh, one of the key advantages of the model-based um, approach is going to be um, the uh, enhanced capabilities uh, for uh, probable maximum flood computations. Um, we'll point you know, the, um, um, uh, John pointed to the recommendation in which we develop guidance on annual exceedance probabilities. Um, and one of the things that's discussed in the report uh, is that it is highly undesirable to have large changes as you move from um, near-term enhancements to model-based. And so we don't envision a process in which the transition results uh, in large changes uh, over uh, uh, significant areas in probable maximum precipitation. But those are, uh, those are uh, some of the important issues to wrestle with in this, um, this linkage between near-term enhancements uh, and the long-term model-based approach. Other thoughts on from the committee? Well, oh, John, do you want to go first? Sure, I would just kind of point, um, since I wrote the box 2-4 uh, in chapter 2 as a review, so the uh, PMF was really outside the committee's purview, outside our statement of task. Uh, but what we did do, um, based on reviewer comments, which really helped our report um, um, improve is note the atmospheric variables. So where the models really do great is giving us additional information on moisture for antecedent soil moisture for snowmelt calculations, uh, air temperature, wind speeds, specific humidity, those sorts of things that really could help with the PMF. Um, so that's what I was going to say on that one. Um, and the decision parts on that second bullet are really you know, as Jim said, we don't want to have these massive changes. And I guess the, one of the important things we did do is, or the committee did, is make recommendations on including climate change for the near-term enhancements so that your decisions on infrastructure can include climate change now. Whether you choose to do it in the short-term adjustments or waiting for a long-term, that's, you know, I think outside our purview. I wanted to make a comment about the this the first of these two questions, which is like, how does the new definition of PMP impact PMF? And and something that I've thought of just you know just now in, in response to this question is, is you can think about that PMF process as being essentially very similar to what you've done before. The mechanics would be very similar. You in the past, let's say users had received a precipitation depth from an HMR shapefile uh, uh, across the United States, and they've extracted a region. I mean we would hopefully think that the mechanics would be relatively similar moving forward and that the user could receive a precipitation depth over a specific watershed or a spatial extent. And that would be the input. One of the improvements that we're recommending is these uncertainty estimates. So in the past, perhaps users thought that the PMP was fixed. Um, and then here we're saying this is perhaps a best estimate and here's an, a, an upper estimate and a lower estimate. And so that can change maybe the mechanics of this, of that process, but I think how a user uses this data would hopefully be very similar to what users are already accustomed to in terms of forcing a, a rainfall runoff model or something of the sort. Thank you guys. Uh, so we only have a few more minutes left. So I would love to just invite, we have so many committee members here with us today. I'm so grateful for all of you in, in spending your time and joining us. And I'm I'm curious, the report just came out a few hours ago. Um, people are probably just getting a chance to dive into it. And I'm curious if there's anything else that you want to add that you haven't had gotten a chance to say yet, or you really want to make sure people um, take away from this webinar after they log off in a few minutes. Gosh. Hmm. May, may I say something? Going back to the issue of uh, what other countries are doing and around the world, WMO and so forth, um, I recall that we did have a briefing by some international experts, like for example, from Switzerland, that they use some climate adjustment factors, et cetera. So I want to point out that this is, uh, US is leading this effort. 
because it will be an issue. It is an issue across the world. Uh, and um, when we said all hands on deck, of course, we mean federalism, et cetera, but the international community adding to the uh, research and expertise that is needed for this long-term vision will be something important. I think Effie gets the last word. Yeah, that was a great, a great last word. Thank you for, for sharing that. And again, thanks to all of these fantastic uh, committee members and panelists here today. Um, it's been a, a joy to work with you all. And I'm so excited to see this report out in the world. Um, and that was all the time that we have for questions today. So thank you to everybody who joined us online. Like I mentioned in the introduction, a recording of this webinar with closed captions will be available on the National Academy's website in the coming days. So keep a lookout for that. Um, once you exit this webinar, you'll be redirected to our report page. Uh, so with that, thank you again to our speakers and to our audience members and have a great rest of your day.